So today I'd like to talk about the anthropology of the upright spine. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about the spine, uh, a lot of different views, both medical and orthopedic and anatomical, about the use of the spine. So I want to take us back into anthropology and look at one of the reasons why we're bipedal. And the big reason is why we have three curves in the spine and how to use the spine efficiently. And the way the spine actually works is that all these segmented joints are articulated by small muscles called multifidus muscles and they develop at six weeks in utero with the eye. And so our, our eye movements and spanner movements are integrated from that very early embryological age. The joints that articulate in the spine are known as facet joints. And a man called Dr. Eli who researched into the sacroiliac joint and studied scoliosis and scoliotic patterns as a chiropractor way back in the 50s with a man called Dr. James, studied this joint carefully and realized that it produced a movement of axial flexion and turned it into rotational torque. Now, if we look at one joint at a time, this is not that important. But if you look at the whole of the spine as being a tension coupled unit or what we call a gear chain, then what you have with the gear chain is that if you put an angular velocity in at the input, say we move the sacrum here, then that angular velocity when it exits, which could be at the head, will be measured the same in mathematical calculations. And this is how the spine actually works. So the eyes with the multifidus muscles contract around the spinal vertebra, producing axial torque as it side bends across these curves to produce a dynamic power that is then expressed to the limbs. This power that goes to the limbs is a true power and not strength. And the difference between true power and strength is the way we use our hands. Uh, chimpanzees have a power grip, so they can hold things and, and break coconuts or break things up with, with stones, but they don't have what we know as a precision grip. And when the human, millions of years ago, decided to make flint tools, he expressed a dexterity and coordination in our fingers, which far outstrips any animal on the planet. And that gives a massive input to being uh, hunters and gatherers and, and uh, predators. Uh, and when we look at the hand, it's a three-dimensional hand as opposed to the monkey's grip, which is a very two-dimensional use of the hand. So what we have in the hand is what we call flexure lines. These are the lines that come around the palm here. And you can see that this line here encompasses these three fingers and this one encompasses the one finger and the thumb is left separate. So in a three-dimensional hand we have three planes existing at one time in one place. This allows for precision, uh, it allows for dexterity and lots of maneuverability around tools, weapons and everything else. Ancient man would have used this because we have to swing, we had to use clubs, we had to fight, uh, we had to wade in water, we had to pick, and so we needed all of these nature uh, and natural uh, things. And I believe that ancient man had a precocious, and that means innate or born with, skills that were passed down, and that's our instincts. Instinctual knowledge is, is knowledge that is passed down. Once again, in, in ancient times, uh, we, our hand was a very dexterous tool, and it was designed to draw things towards uh, and, and move things around. And so if you move your body around a weapon, it has much more potency than striking with a weapon. But as we became more specialized and probably needed uh, armies in short demand, uh, we started to train soldiers and they would have been trained in maybe six to 12 weeks to develop armies very quickly. And then we were giving them weapons which would hack or, or, or damage in different ways and almost like a hammer or an axe or a big heavy sword. And so it made sense then to be bigger and stronger. So people started to muscularize. And as people muscularized, they also became more grip orientated, which took away the whole dexterity of the hand. Uh, but a warrior, on the other hand, would have been very dexterous. He would be able to fire a bow and arrow from left or right. He'd be able to do this while he's riding a horse. He would use lots of weapons, which he could take from different body parts. Uh, he could attack what we would call the Q-shield of a person in armour by being able to dexterously go under here and use weapons to cut. And so those were the tools of the warrior, but we start to lose as we became specialised as, as armies. 
And then later on, uh, we got the Industrial Revolution, which made us very highly skilled at doing one task, but less skilled at using these dexterity skills. So in a factory, you might have a person pulling a lever a thousand times a day, uh, which became our repetitive strains. And we've even carried that on into modern life uh, to become sports. A lot of sports are one-sided and people don't use both sides of the body. And what I tell people such as golfers or any, anybody uh, of the sportsmen that we work on as therapists, that if you've got uh, dexterity or ambidexterity in both sides of the body, whatever side you use for your sport, you'll be better because your brain is operating on a different level. We have uh, our brains, we have an amygdala brain, which is basically our survival brain that is, again, precociously constantly aware of our surroundings. Uh, and our surroundings, one time, when they were more dangerous as an environment, we'd have been vigilant, but on a relaxed intensity um, way, so that we're, we're observing around, looking for something like that. Whereas nowadays we use predominantly our left brain with IT workers, uh, and artists would use the right brain, but we're not using all three brains together. Uh, and that's a very important uh, natural instinct that we need to develop. And that goes in keeping with the use of the spine and the use of the body, which then develops this potency of pendular motion or, or uh, power that comes to the fingers. Um, so we need to look at the, the way the spine works. And one of the ways the spine works is, is, is from a science which we call tensegrity, which was developed over 25 years ago by a man called Dr. Stephen Levin. And he looked at the integrity of the body and he looked at the anatomy of the body and found that there were shortfalls. Anatomically, we can't lift things in the way that uh, Newtonian principles say we can. For instance, if, if a, a 12 stone man picked up a, a two stone child, there's about 1,200 vec pounds of vectored force would go to the fifth lumber. It would just be impossible, we'd damage ourselves. And yet we can move things around very easily. And so this is a, a tensegra model of a pelvis. So if we were walking, and this is the leg, the, the iliac bones are the hip bones, and these are the legs, this is representing the, the pelvis. As we're walking, you can see that the tension integrity of all of the stays and all of the cables is constantly the same. It's reciprocally balanced, and that means it's cancelled out on either side. It's balanced at all times, front, back, left and right. And so this allows for a walking model. And as we move the thorax on this kind of a pelvis, then we produce pendular power through the spinal's axis from this gear chain uh, that couples up to give us this tremendous uh, potency. But another, another thing that happens reflexly is when we take our head into either this flexion or extension phase, all of the flexor muscles switch on with flexion and all the extensor muscles switch on with extension. So if we want to push something and we take our head up, we have all of the muscles that would aid that movement all coupling at one time. And the same if we want to draw something to the body, flexion aids that. Then of course if you put side bend into that, so you have side bend, flexion and extension properties with rotation, then the spine follows that tension coupling and provides that pulling or pushing power which is much more potent than using angular muscles on fixed uh, lever points and, and fulcrum points. And that's the point that most people miss nowadays. And so when we look at the arm and we use a power grip, we're, we're losing all of the integrity that can be delivered from the spine and making it come from our pectoral muscles, biceps, triceps muscles and flexors. And this causes terrific strain. And we use what we call a short arc when we do that. So if I'm holding a club really, really tightly, then I tend to muscularize to this point here, which is the sternum, where the muscles meet. If, however, I want to use a weapon and I want strength, and I want to swing a club even with more power, then I have to use a long arc. And the long arc comes right from the fingers all the way through the spinal dynamics, right to the foot, which is in contact with the ground, which we call the interface. And when we muscularize, we, we just strain and, and cause uh, weaknesses and vulnerability to the body and those strains are actually transferred to different parts. So a golfer might uh, miss a cue and, and get golfer's elbow, he can get tenosynovitis here, he can get bursitis on the shoulders, he'll classically get low back sacroiliac problems and lumbar problems. And even on the, the last part of the rotational part of the, 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 the stroke, he can actually get ankle problems on the ligaments here as, he, as his foot turns because he has breaks in the kinematic chain. If however you don't have these breaks in the kinematic chain, then what you've got is this gear chain of tremendous power and potency that then delivers the, and makes the ball carry much, much further and become a power stroke as opposed to a strength stroke.